Hello listeners, watchers, subscribers and fans and welcome to the SDR Disco Call Show. My name is Neil Buyan and I'm your host. If this is your first time joining or if you're coming back for another dose of SDR Disco Call fun, this show is all for sales development reps or people working in the world of tech sales and business development. And what we like to do is meet interesting and cool people to see how do they kind of get into this career? What advice would they give to people thinking about entering tech sales? You know, learning more about their journeys, and I'm your host. And with these two guests, these are people that actually approached me and got into my DMs uh, and spoke about how they've been listening to the show and watching the show, and they'd like to come on board and share their stories. But as a gentle reminder, if you're listening to this in your local podcast platform or you're watching this on YouTube, please make sure that you give us a like, comment, subscribe, and share. And if you want to comment down below or ask our guests any questions and reach out to them, feel free to do so. So I'm going to come over to Umaro number one. James, could you please introduce yourself? Who are you, sir? Where are you based in the world? And what do you do? Um, thanks, Neil. I, uh, my name's James. I'm the business development manager here at Cantata, uh, based in London. Um, I've been leading the team for, for over a year now. Um, and uh, yeah, I uh, like to get out, travel, uh, go to the gym, socialize, drink or two, drink a, a pint of Guinness or two. Ooh. Um, and, uh, and yeah, just, uh, just kind of, um, enjoying the London life really. Can't get better than that's a strong intro, dude. I love that. Thank you very much. And Mr. Edwards, Ollie, could you please introduce us? Who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? And also, could you give us a little bit of an insight as to what your company does? Of course. Thanks ever so much, Neil. Um, hi all, I'm Ollie Edwards, uh, so I'm the Senior Enterprise BDR at Cantata. Um, I've been here a year, a couple of weeks ago actually, um, so not too long in the business or in sales. Um, what do I like to do outside of work? Um, advocate for football, um, play it, uh, watch it, um, try my arm at golf very badly. <laughs> um so i like keeping the the green keepers at work um and same as same as james really um socializing having a few bevies after uh after finishing the graft i love that strong intro gents and thank you so much for joining in today's show and funny you said guinness i've literally just come back from dublin Ireland from a week of sastock and i didn't touch one guinness i don't know what it was everybody was telling me that neil you need to really taste the guinness out there but when people tell me what to do, I then not don't I don't want to do it. So uh, maybe I need to make up. It is so much better out there, though, Neil. <laughs> I've heard I've heard like they were they were banging on about it. But um, what we like to do at this point of the show is kind of come to your LinkedIn profiles to get um, a bit of an insight as to your backgrounds, where you've been, and where you've come from. And obviously, this time round of the show, this is what I really love about these episodes. We've got a dynamic duo here, ladies and gents. So we've got somebody who works within management and somebody who is an individual contributor as well. So we've got a little bit of story to go and figure out, but we'll try and keep this short, sweet, and brief so we can really get down into the actual conversation as well. But James, with yourself, like having a quick through on your LinkedIn, you've kind of worked in quite a lot of different experiences. So, you know, MDs, uh, I love that. Uh, working within human resources, being a BD, uh, and then Cantata as well. In two minutes, could you just like kind of give us the main headlines, James, as to like how did you get into sales and kind of like how did you get to where you are today, sir? Yeah, um, I think uh, I really found sales in a way that that um, that kind of came from the fact that HR wasn't really providing me with the kind of the people um, and relationship building. Um, elements that I was looking for in business. Yeah. So um, went to uni, studied business management. Really enjoyed the kind of the, the learning about how organisations and people are managed. Um, and when uh, I was kind of working in HR, I felt like I was a little bit at the back of the business instead of the mm. front of the business. <clears throat> and I think um, 
with the the relationship building skills that I had and the real core in, the real core interest in how business and businesses work together, um, plus the fact that I wanted to make uh, a bit of money, there was uh, a desire there mm. um, to kind of explore other avenues. Um, and yeah, did a bit of research uh, for about six months or so um, into kind of did some informational interviews, spoke to a couple of people in the industry. Um, and as a result of that, landed my first job at Tempo uh, as a business development executive there. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, made the move over to Cantata um, six months later and started out as a BDR, BDR here, um, moving up to management a year later. Boom. Thank you very much, James. And there's some definite things that I do want to ask you within today's episode. Mm -hmm. Kind of around those points as well. Um, and so thank you for that. And for, for Ollie, kind of similar to yourself, could you kind of like in two minutes give us, you know, the headlines as to like, how did you get into sales and how did you get up to where you are today? Yeah, so um, actually quite similar uh, to James from the HR point, um, but really went to uni, um, did criminology degree, mm. um, very much trying to follow uh, going into criminal law, which I initially wanted to do. Um, came out of that and uh, realized that that wasn't the route for me um so almost fell into a hr systems role mm -hmm. um through someone i know which was which was great um working for quite a big company a uh, very corporate company but um learned a lot of lessons along the way there um and actually then it was got to the point where i'd moved to london um it was a chance to branch out and and see what was available um and always had a bit of a fancy towards sales Mm -hmm. um, but it was actually my, a, a close friend of mine who was at Cantata, um, doing really well, who sort of encouraged me and, and pushed me to go. Um, so that, that then brought me to, to go through the interview process, um, love sort of the people that I was chatting to and, and where I wanted to, to get to. And, and that's where back September, I made the, made the jump and the, the risk, which I'll, I'm sure I'll touch on later. Yep. Um, and sort of haven't looked back in, into where I am now. I love that, dude. And just out of curiosity, criminology, and then obviously coming into sales, <laughs> what was the story behind criminology? Why did you want to get into that? And are there any synergies that you see with what you were studying in terms of kind of what you're doing today, just out of curiosity? Um, so, yeah, great question. Uh, for me, it was come out of uh, sixth form straight into wanted to go to university and always wanted to... I was fascinated by uh, criminal law, um, mm. so it was very much tunnel vision towards that route. Um, but heard stories from a couple of friends and, and the paralegal route, and actually it's a long, long way to, to get where you need to be, mm. um, which I think that, that made me turn, and, and that coupled with uh, the famous gap year traveling <laughs> um, made me realize, actually, let's come back. Um, and then that's when I took on a, an account and finance master degree. Mm -hmm. um, to get me back on course. I think to your initial question around synergies, I don't think um, I could get away with saying criminology is like sales, but um, <laughs> I think there's certainly some lessons there around how people think and um, more of the sociology side mm -hmm. in terms of how to speak to people and how to negotiate and get, get what you want, um, which is probably the, the closest takeaway I could probably lean on. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing, Ollie. Uh, so, James, coming back to yourself, so you're somebody that, you know, stated you worked within HR systems and you weren't getting really what you wanted when you were, like, kind of in the back end side mm -hmm. of things, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you're coming through into this sort of world where you were a BDR at Cantata and then you've moved up into management. Curious to know, like, what was your motivations? Well, well actually, let me answer the question another way. Were you always aiming to go into management or was there kind of like a, a, a point where you thought, right, management's the way I wanted to go after mm. an experience? How did that work? Um, yeah, good question. I think I, uh, when I worked at McDonald's, uh, I was leading a, kind of a lead in a department there and was a, kind of a shift manager there. And I think that was my first real experience of kind of management and team leadership. Mm. Um, so, and, and thoroughly enjoyed it. So I kind of always knew that I had that kind of, um, that ability and that kind of desire to kind of get into management eventually. I originally wanted to become an account executive when I first started, and, and that was kind of the desire and the, the route that I wanted to go down. Um, with the eventual aim of getting into management after mm -hmm. that uh, that closing experience, um, and then I came into the BDR role and and found a 
real passion for business development and a real love for it. Um, and I think the craft was just was just kind of the way that you have to craft and and kind of adapt and, and make yourself dynamic to kind of suit the needs of a prospect and the, mm. uh, the ever-changing demands of the uh, market uh, was just fascinating to me. So um, that combined with the fact that uh, one of my, my manager at the time took some extended leave and I kind of took up a bit of a team lead, just mm. stepped up into a bit of a team lead role. Yeah. Um, and with the growth of the organization and our sales enablement function, uh, the opportunity to actually then manage the team came along. Yeah. Um, and it just felt like the natural, it felt like the natural next step. Um, and, and yeah, I haven't looked back. So the desire wasn't there when I first initially became a BD rep. Yeah. Um, but I think combining the, the passion and the uh, love that I found for BD, but mm. also being able to share that and lead a team with that kind of passion. Um, it felt it felt natural to come take take a step into management. I love that. Thank you. I'm going to come back on to that point in a moment about um, you know taking on that team lead initial start kickoff before you went fully full blown down mm-hmm. onto the management road because I got a question this week from somebody I think you might be able to help out on. Um, but coming back to yourself, Ollie, with like you know doing this BD role. So as you said earlier, you spoke to a couple of friends working in the sort of space and getting a bit of an insight. What was the attraction for you to get into a sales role and a BD role? Like, what stood out to you, and what was your understanding back then of what it was compared to what it is now? Yeah, um, good point. I, I think uh, to say I was in I was in HR systems, so I was working very closely with SAP um, success factors. So whilst I was in a HR role, I was very akin to. Um, sort of software and technology um, and how that works. And actually it was partnering quite closely with a consultant at the time doing sort of solution engineering, showing people demos, et cetera, mm. off the tool. Um, so taking that that into sales, it was, it was still quite a jump. Um, and actually listening to some sort of my friends, learning what I did throughout the interview process. Um, I think BDR is a, is a stepping stone for, for a cat executive, which is I, I still want to aim to get to. Mm. Um, and actually the, the risk was that it was taking a, an actual drop on, on money initially for, from base salary, mm. um, and obviously never been in a, a target driven or commission role before. Um, lots of people said, oh, you, you can chat, you've got the gift of the gab, etc." but actually it was me that needed to take the risk, <laughs> yeah. um, which I did. Um, and whilst it's, I, I think I knew what I was coming into. I think it's very, um, KPI driven, metric driven, lots of uh, phone calls, emails, etc. cetera. Um, but actually, I think when you get to a point where you can manage that and you've got something that works for you, a rhythm and, and it's repeatable, um, actually that that comes quite easily in terms of metrics. Um, mm. And sort of I've got to a place now where those things are repeatable and I've created a model which which is repeatable. So I think where I want to get to is, is I'm on that path to get there. But um, yeah. yeah, there was a lot of, in the early days, a lot of uh, apprehension and should I take the jump or should I just work my way up? Yeah. Um, but actually that, that drop in salary is uh, a distant memory. So <laughs> happy days. I love that. And I, I want to, uh, where you're talking about it being a KPI and driven metric role, and you're right, it is. I want to come back to that in a moment because again, there are some things that our listeners may be going through now because it's early days for them with some fears and anxieties. And I kind of want to figure out, like, how do you manage that? So I'll come back to that in a minute, if that's right with you, Ollie. Uh, but James, coming back to you, uh, whilst at Sastock this week, met a lovely gentleman, you know, he's a top performing BDR. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has an opportunity where his manager is taking some time off, right? And here's an opportunity for him to, you know, test the ropes of being a team lead. Now, mm-hmm. admittedly, feeling a bit nervous about it. And, you know, working with his peers and now, you know, kind of leading the team, not as a manager yet, but this is kind of like, you know, uh, going for a test run. Mm. And he's a bit shook and he's a bit worried about it. And he's kind of asking me like, okay, what things should I be preparing for? What should I be doing? How should I be working with the team, et cetera, et cetera. In your own experience where you were going through that, taking on that team lead role, what bits of advice or firstly, what was it like? going from individual contributor to now having an element of being a team lead yeah and what tips would you give to this young chap who's going to go through the same thing in a moment yeah um i think 
uh, it felt, uh, I think it felt um, quite good to be able to know that um, I was working with a couple of like younger reps who had just like younger tenured reps uh, mm. ultimately had just kind of started out um, their career at Cantata. And I think um, as someone that, uh, that generally likes to see people succeed and develop, um, through th- sort of the lens of being able to impart my knowledge um, to help them do so. I think that's probably the one thing that I'd say um, is a great opportunity for anyone going into a team lead role is to really um, sense how much reward and achievement you get from helping people develop and succeed mm. um, and using the time as a team lead role without any real kind of management responsibility to really hone that kind of development coaching um and uh and yeah training element of of the role yeah um and being able to go what do i know what 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 do, what works for me being able to kind of take those repeatable and uh and successful methods um, especially if he's like a top performer like uh, looking internally and going, well, now what can I do to to help others be be kind of like like me? Um, and uh, yeah, I think using it, seeing it as an opportunity to really hone in on on your coaching skills um, is uh, is something that I would uh, would recommend. So not getting too caught up in the management and the one to ones, and I think being able to run training sessions and um do a call do a few core reviews mm. um but just be a presence on the floor and like actually take a moment to kind of listen into calls and say actually um you could have maybe done that a little better or well done that was really good maybe mm. let's try this next time um yeah having a having that kind of like coaching presence i think as a team lead um is is the most important thing um and yeah that's that's the tips that i'd, I'd probably give uh probably give to him yeah i love that those are some solid tips and i think you know being in that position myself in the past as well, it can be very daunting because where you are an individual contributor with on your team, and yes, you can be a top performer. uh, There is this fear of, for some, and for me it was, okay, I'm one of you guys. I'm still one of you guys. So now I'm trying to lead this thing and I'm trying to help out. Mm. And I had initial, like, maybe imposter syndrome might be the word of, are they going to believe in me? Are they going to listen to me? Are they going to be open to me helping them out? But as you mentioned there, getting in the trenches and helping them do the things that they're currently doing, that's how you can kind of win uh, their trust and build mm. it with them. But, you know, uh, in order to gain respect, you have to give a bit of respect back to them as well. And I went through a lot of failures and F-ups uh, trying to figure that out. But, yeah, eventually it gets there. But I think I kind of also said to him, I said, like, if your manager is entrusting you in this, then recognize that he also recognizes your skill set and mm. potential. So kind of believe in yourself that you can do it. And the only way you're going to figure out if this is for you as a long-term career is just try it out. Mm. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect, but give it a go and you'll, you'll learn things from that as well. Um, and coming back to you, Ollie. So again, whilst at SAS stock uh, and being a sales coach, some people come to me like a sales therapist. And one of the key themes for, you know, this year has been around the anxiety around having to perform and hit KPIs and hitting targets and this relentless thing of, okay, let's try and smash out the month and the beginning of the month we start at zero. And for a lot of people that aren't used to sales or had never worked in sales before, this in itself can bring up a lot of fears, you know. Um, We're even to the point where three months into the role, they're like, I don't know if this is for me. I'm thinking about quitting or I'm thinking about going to another company or perhaps, you know, going in for a completely different department and role. How do you, sir, for somebody that is a top performer in the early days, how did you manage that anxiety or if there was any sort of stress? And are there any tips that you could give to people that are maybe going through those hard times? Yeah. Um, no, I, I, again, Neil can, uh, can empathize there. That, that's sort of the, the apprehension I had when, when moving. I think um, Whilst I hadn't had any sales experience, I think I was in quite a good position in the sense that I didn't have any preconceived ideas of what a BDR process looks like, um, how I might approach it. Um, so really the, the step I took was just to throw myself in, um, understand the processes and, and Cantata's got some great processes and um, enablement in place and really forget anything else and focus on what's worked before um, and what's going to work moving forward. Mm. Um, and, and on that, 
again, it's 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 going to be timing for for different people. But I joined at quite a nice period. I joined at the end of um, September, going into um, October, um, and at Cantata, our financial year starts in Feb. Hmm. Um, so I really used those initial three four months to get the processes on on board, try it, trial and error, find an approach that worked for me. Um, so that when February came, uh, start the new financial year, head down, um, and I've got a repeatable model model that works. Um, mm-hmm. And and really, that, I think that's what's led me to to be so successful. Um, I think some couple of other tips is trial and speak to other top performers. I think obviously if that's worked for them, yeah, um, they're not doing anything out of the ordinary or different. They're just sticking sticking to the process. They're making sure they're top of the any dashboard in sight, whether it's metrics or opportunities and, and dollar creation, um, and really use that to to live month by month. And if you have a good month, then take on the lessons learned and, and take that into the next month, um, which really is is all I've, I've done. I think people come to me and say, oh, you, you must do something different. And I know mm. it's uh, <laughs> sticking to process, sticking to metrics. And fortunately, that, that led me to, to hit my annual plan after six months so uh it was huge yeah Boom. i love that thank you and th- those are some solid tips as well and i think you know james coming uh back to you on on, on the manager side mm-hmm. um so another conversation i had this week where somebody is thinking about management and the manager kind of said to them is you need to really fall in love with the data and he kind of she kind of said to me he's like what's your opinion on that and i said i'll be honest with you in the early days, and even to this day, I'm not very data driven. I know the data and what works and everything, but I'm not a big fan of it. I'm more, you know, the techniques and the performance side of it. And I had this conversation with Andy Laws a couple of months back as well. But what I said to them is initially, when you're an individual contributor, you're looking on the input of your activity yeah. of the number of dials, calls, etc. But over time, I learned you had to be also aware of the output of all of those things that you're doing. Yeah. So, you know, if you do X amount of calls or you bring X amount of meetings in, what is the conversion rate to qualified pipeline? And I said, ultimately, when I was an SDR, all I gave a damn about was of the meetings that I book, which one of those converted into closed customers? Mm. And, you know, what could I put my names to? But in terms of data, like what advice would you give to individual contributors or SDRs as to how to view their data is not just on the input, but also on the output and the work that they're doing? What advice would you give to them or how would you tell them or how would you advise them to fall in love with the data? Mm. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think um, you've got to, as a, as a BDR, like you've got to make sure that, that when, you're, when you're kind of coming to work every day, you're, you're kind of looking at what do I need to do today to achieve success? And I think looking at, looking at kind of the big picture and, and seeing, right, last month I sent 2,000 emails and I made 1,100 calls mm. um, and I sent 500 LinkedIn messages. Um, out of all of those, if you can look at that month and then compare it to kind of what your performance was, um, then ultimately, you know, if you are being consistent in your achievement, um, then ultimately it becomes a bit of an internal competition. So if you haven't, if you haven't, if you've made kind of 1100 calls and you go, do you know what, next month I'm going to see if I can do 1300 because if that, if I do 1300, then ultimately I'm going to be able to see if yeah. I do an extra 200, could there be an extra, an extra kind of meeting out there for me? Mm. Um, and I think that's what I, kind of saw it, saw it as, as a, a BDR and as, as our manager is that uh, I like to see that, that my team are completing the most activities and, but also knowing that that's actually producing great output as well. Yeah. Um, so tr- I like to see data as a bit of a, an, a, an internal competition. Mm-hmm. How can I be at the top of the activity leaderboard? How can mm-hmm. I make sure that I'm doing the most work that I can do? Um, because nobody wants to be at the bottom of any leaderboard, especially <laughs> in sales. Yeah. So I think looking at looking at if I'm at the top and then actually breaking down, okay, so you can then go, I'm doing the most amount of activity that I can do, and then you can start to break down from there, knowing I've I've done that part of the the kind of the the element of the job and the KPIs and the metrics. Now I can actually kind of start to take away 
well, what's my open rate like? What's my reply rate like? What's mm. my, uh, what is my call talk time uh, like? What is my connect rate like? And how, and then you can start to kind of break that down. And from there, you can then get really granular as to, okay, from, from the amount of emails I sent at a 40% reply, uh, open rate, Three percent reply rate, um, but all of those three percent replies, eighty uh, percent of them were objections. You can then start to get more granular, and that's how coaching, from uh, a manager's perspective, but also an individual contributor's perspective, starts to align. Because mm. you know, if I'm hitting my goals every day and I'm making it a competition and I'm winning that competition, then I know that I'm doing that that piece there. But then you can start to actually kind of break it down um, and start to kind of identify for yourself. Um, where where you may need coaching um, and help from your manager to to achieve um, the outcomes like meetings booked, qualified pipe, mm. closed revenue, um, because output and sorry input and the the metrics plus the quality of that that kind of input yeah. um, ultimately will equal the output that you're desiring, whether that's meeting booked, qualified pipe, or closed revenue. I love that so eloquently put. And I think, you know, the key, the key takeaway that speaking to a lot of SDRs and SDR managers is initially you're told to do these sort of activities. And then you may even get to a point of like, why the hell am I doing this? Like, why do we have to do these activities mm. and stuff? And it's really good to understand it's not just a case of doing it, but it's what will come off the back of it and that output. But then, like you said, figuring out your kind of go to market plan as an SDR or BDR as to how you're going to achieve success how you're going to book those meetings, how you're going to help drive our business forward with your impact that you're doing day to day. So, you know, for, for SDRs and BDRs out there, I always encourage them to ask their, their managers, how did you get to those KPIs? How did you get mm. to those benchmarks? Historically, if we look at back a year ago, is that what we were doing? We're doing less or more? And that way the manager can say, well, look, here's kind of a blueprint of how we've succeeded up until today. This is kind of why we do these things. But here's an opportunity for yourself to try something new within that realm and see what you get off the back mm. of it. Um, again, and as you mentioned, like nobody wants to be at the bottom of those dashboards and leaderboards. So, Ollie, coming to yourself, um, another topic I hear from a lot of SDRs is the fear. Well, it's kind of like uh, I say comparison is the thief of joy. So somebody may come on board and they see their name at the bottom or they see an Ollie at the top and they're like, how the hell am I going to get there? And my advice to them is try not to compare yourself to other people because they've gone through different paths and experiences to get to that point. But have you ever experienced that fear of, well, have you ever compared yourself to other people? And has it ever come to like your detriment? Or, you know, what advice would you give to people that are fairly new and they can't but help compare themselves to what they're seeing on LinkedIn or you know, seeing on the dashboards, how do you manage that? Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think obviously being in a, a sales environment, and there's dashboards and numbers essentially flying around. I think it's very easy to compare yourself to other people. Um, I think the key point, as you mentioned, is on those dashboards, it doesn't say tenure. It doesn't say how long you've been at the uh, doing sales, for instance. So I think you've just got to take it as face value. Um, yes, someone might be at the top one month. Are they going to be at the top next month? Um, and as I said, as long as you're doing what you need to be doing on the ground and you're confident that you're putting the metrics in, um, then you've, you've, got to, you've got to focus on that. Otherwise, three months, six months in, it is very easy to get bogged down with numbers, get bogged down with who's top performer. Mm. Um, and you, you're just in a, in a vicious cycle and that will have a knock-on effect on when you get a chance on the phone. Um, you're already thinking that you, you're not confident to take it, or you're not. You wish someone else was taking it. This top former, hmm. um, and, and a funny thing, someone um, people always say to me is, "Oh, I, I wouldn't like um, to do sales or the pressures and, and numbers." But I think take away the numbers, all you're doing each day is, is speaking to people, um, and we all do that down the pub or whatever. If you can just transfer that and relax hmm. and speak to people rather than putting all this pressure on numbers on where you're going to be and where you need to be, um, the, the rest is a, is a byproduct in my eyes. I love that. I love that. And you're right. You know, like we're <laughs> with sales, it could be the art, the science. And kind of when I was in SAS stock in Dublin this week and I was looking across the massive event floor with hundreds of salespeople, I felt in my element. I just said, what we'll, all we do is just have 
conversations with her. We chat like salespeople can chat for England. Mm. Trust me, the amount of conversations we had. But it's having those meaningful conversations. And yes, if you focus on the quality of those conversations and the people you talk to, the numbers will come, you know. And to your point, I love that on the dashboard, it doesn't have how long you've been doing that role, you know, but it also doesn't tell you how many times that person has failed or gone through errors in order to refine their approach and become better at what they're doing, right? Um, and kind of thinking it from a management point, so like staying, sticking with you, Ollie, like James, you've mentioned, you know, training, coaching and managing and those things. Ollie, like the things that I used to get wrong as a manager back in the day was I used to get in the way of my reps, right? By some of the meetings that I used to put in their calendar, I used to be that horrible micromanager talking about the metrics and the numbers. And why haven't you like logged it in the CRM? If it doesn't exist, if it's not in the CRM, it doesn't exist. But as an individual contributor, how best can a manager make use of your time during the week? And what is important for you for them to be there for? And to kind of sometimes just get out of the way. What, what's that for you, sir? Sorry, was that was that to me? Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> ah, sorry, I thought you were going down to, to James. Um, no, I, I, um, it's a good point. I think from my experience, I came from, like I said, um, Nomad, Nomad Foods, and there I had a was lucky enough to to be have a manager that was a, a director. Hmm. Um, so without, uh, it happened sort of by accident that he wasn't around all the time. There wasn't that chance to be micromanaged. There wasn't pressures on me um but i actually quite like that mm. um and, and moving into cantata when i first met um james it was very much can i transfer that style of management into here but mm. fully appreciating that this is a totally different industry there's going to be loads of stuff i don't know um but as much as possible i like to just go away trial and error bring stuff to the table bring suggestions to to james and move forward yeah. um and and james has been been great at that and i think that's one of the keys to the success um i think there's been times naturally in a in a role like this where um you might get carried away month to month and you you're doing well but then you start to forget the the processes you forget what made you book those many meetings um so i think it's it's essential to yeah have a um less of a sort of focus on on one-to-ones and management but actually when when there is times where you have taken a dip it often takes someone else to tell you actually that where's the, where's all the success gone? Where's all that mm. process gone? Um, so that would be my, my biggest tip is, is ha- try and build a relationship with, with you, with the manager that you've got autonomy and you've got chances to trial and error. Um, but you know that when stuff does start, shit starts hitting the fan, for instance, you've got yeah. someone there to, to hold you accountable and, and make you better. So I, think I'd, I'd, I think I'd add to that a little bit as well from kind of like the management perspective. I think seeing, uh, seeing, I think seeing success um, in the early stages obviously gives you a lot of confidence as a manager. Yeah. <clears throat> and seeing someone pick up process and understand methodology and just throw themselves straight into it, but then start to, to actually become really successful in the very first few months. Um, it is easy to kind of take your hands off and kind of say, hey, look, you kind of do what you need to do. And, yeah. um, and I think that's kind of how Ollie and I uh, really worked together effectively was um, we both knew that the way that Ollie was going to work best was that we knew there was a sense of accountability from both of us, that we were going to hold each other to account for the actions that we were uh, defining, the, the trainings we were holding. But we, we, we made sure to use all of our kind of one-to-ones um, and all of our in-person time effectively to make sure that we we're communicating any kind of areas for coaching and any areas for development. Um, and I think um, one of the biggest things uh, that has made Ollie so successful in this relationship as well um, is the ability to hold his hands up and say, "Actually, I think I'm. I think I'm falling down the hole a little bit here. I mm. think I'm. I think I'm. I think I'm actually kind of." Um, I think I'm kind of losing a little bit of that rhythm and momentum um, and self-identifying areas for, for opportunity development, um, bringing those to me and saying, hey, James, like, uh, this is not working at the moment. I, mean, I think we need to have a chat. Um, and I think as a, as a BDR, it's so important to, um, to strip away that kind of ego 
and say, hey, actually, I, I still do need help and I yeah. still do need advice. Like it's good to obviously go away and seek advice from LinkedIn and craft your own, uh, yeah, like and, and craft your own kind of style. But sometimes it's, uh, yeah, you've got to strip away the ego and go, do you know what, even though I'm one of the, the global top performers, I still need I still need someone to kind of say, hey, maybe you need to try and do this a little bit differently and, and try and see them. So I think it's important to uh, I think it's important to kind of be um, be autonomous and as a rec- as a manager, kind of recognise when a when a rep and an individual contributor wants to be autonomous. Yeah. Um, but making sure that you're um, that you're kind of identifying opportunities, but ensuring that you give them the uh, the trust in you that they can they can uh, that they can kind of uh, they can come to you with uh, with with coaching. Um, uh, opportunities as well i love that and you know you, sometimes we do have to swallow our prides when things aren't working out and asking mm. for help is you know a sign of strength and i found you know being a former manager if people come to me saying like neil i need some help shit's not working out i'm trying to figure this stuff out i'm like i respect that person more because they've approached me and i'm like cool happy to help you're mm. open to being coached you're open to being helped i'll okay. give you 110 percent towards that and just like i'd love to quickly touch on um so you've obviously spoken about there's managing there's training and there's coaching and again coming off the back of sas stock some people are thinking about leadership as a, a future career path and they're just like i looked at my manager's calendar the other day and it just it was like what the hell like there are so many things going on and i'm like mm-hmm. you're not just doing your role anymore but you're helping eight to ten different people Hmm. how do you manage your time between managing training and coaching within a working week across different headcount Mm -hmm. um yeah uh, it's been a journey um it's definitely uh taken a lot of um a lot of kind of uh trial and errors um as to kind of how i manage my calendar um i think uh, that's also something that that has that has taught me is as a BDR and then even coming into the to the to the management role is um, I at the end of every quarter look at my calendar and think is this mm. is this an effective way of of managing my time um, and I try and tell my BDRs to do that as well um, mm. have a look at your calendar because when you get stale. Um, things generally aren't going to work as as, uh, as as good as they they might have done, <clears throat> and it kind of is always nice to have a bit of a fresh change. So, um, so the thing that's working for me at the moment is I've found um, I found myself recently not having enough time to complete kind of project work and um, and a lot of change going on in the organization at the moment. So being able to contribute to that change and, mm. and kind of uh, having internal meetings outside of one-to-ones training development uh, areas to kind of work with other obviously managers and leaders in the organization uh, to kind of enact that kind of change and, um, and, uh, and areas of the business that, that need improvement. And that combined with obviously the one-to-ones and working out to kind of where where I need to spend the time with my team as well all started to become a little bit too much yeah um so I thought let me the thing that's working most effectively for me at the moment is having most of my one-to-ones completed by Tuesday um so all of my one-to-ones complete completed by Tuesday we have a training session on Tuesday morning as well um and uh that enables me and uh the team to kind of come together early in the week and say, right, what do we got on this week? What are you feeling good about? What do you think might not be working for you? Um, how does how does your pipeline look at the moment? How can we kind of work together to help you progress stuff? Um, and kind of get people kind of like in the right mindset to kind of enter the rest of the week. Yeah. Um, and I think if you've got a team, um, if you've got a team kind of like of a relative size that you can kind of do that and spread it across kind of two days, mm. um, then I'd highly recommend doing so because it just kind of helps you set up the week uh, for success. Um, and then I've just made sure that I've committed more time recently to to coaching as well. Like I've uh, put two coach two hour long coaching office hours um, in my diary. So um, I've ultimately said to the team, "Hey, look." Um, I'm dedicating those two hours a week for you to kind of drop in and say, Hey, James, like, what can I, can I do this? Can I, can we listen to a few calls? Can we work on a couple of emails? Can we work on multi-threading? 
And it's the same with me. I'll, I'll also, if I identify coaching opportunities, I'll put people into those, those slots as well. And I think um, that was only like in the last quarter that I've done that. Nice. And it's been really effective um, in, in helping kind of everyone sense a little bit more of uh, a coaching culture and, and kind of enabling them to understand that outside of our core training sessions, there's still, uh, there's still time in, in my day to make sure that, um, that we're all getting better together. I love that. Carving those hours in for coaching can make a huge impact to, mm. to your team's performance, like progression, and also helps you get a better understanding as to, you know, their strengths and weaknesses, but it builds that trust as well, where they can come mm -hmm. to you with, I want you to listen to this call. Mm. I want you to review this cadence. I want to know how can I get better? Mm. Um, and, you know, a, a key theme whilst, I don't know, for the last year that I've heard from a lot of leaders is I just don't have the time for it. And I'm like, do you really not have the time or is it that you don't want to do it or you don't know how to do it or how mm. to implement it? And it kind of come, comes into the latter uh, because understandably as managers, you're freaking busy. You're not only helping your team, but you're reporting to other departments and uh, you have to be able to manage your time so you don't burn yourself out as well. And you need to make sure, I think the question I'm always asking those leaders and managers, like, but who's coaching you as well mm. whilst you're coaching all these other people? But coming in terms of progression, Ollie, to, towards yourself, somebody who's, you know, looking to make that next step within your career. Um, a lot of SDRs that I speak to, that's the main thing they want to do. They want to progress. They want to move on to that next step, Ollie, and that's something you're about to embark on. Uh, but a question that I got asked on this VIP coach in Dublin was, what things should I be doing to gear up for that next step and that promotion? And how should I be working with my manager? to help that happen so ollie for yourself where you're soon to be taking this next step and in a year which has been freaking tough for the industry i'm not going to lie right there's been a lot of fears and, and going around but how have you best prepared yourself and how have you utilized james in order to help you succeed on taking that next step ollie uh yeah so uh very much uh on the path to to get into ae where i want to get to at the moment um so it's quite a timely conversations we have in around what I'm doing and, and how I'm setting myself up. I think in terms of James' involvement, it's being deadly honest with with where I want to get to, what the timelines are, um, and for him to be realistic to me as to whether those timelines are right, what I should be doing in, in those timelines to make it happen, um, and for him to be advising on um, not only who I should be speaking to, but giving me a platform to to speak to the, the relevant people. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a great uh, progression plan at Cantata to, to get you to AE, um, or put you in a position to be an AE. Um, but actually, for me, it's rather than just sticking to what the advice is, it's what more can I be doing? Hmm. Um, and personal brand has been been massive for me from right through from university to Nomad to, to here. Um, so I think like on the phones in the sales world every conversation is key um so any chance you get to speak to c-suite uh, sales managers vp um go to them with suggestions feedback what are you seeing done, done well where do you think you could have value um but also put yourself in a position where you can start to do stuff or the role that you want to get into um do that role before you get that role Mm. Um, so can you start to do stuff in the field? And, and James has been great in giving me opportunities, working with AEs to actually take the discovery calls, take the demos um, and get feedback on that. Um, because I think the certifications are great, but they're really the theory behind what you've got to do. Um, mm. And like I've said to James previously, you can do umpteen numbers of role plays internally until you get into the field and doing it with a with a prospect, you're never going to learn what your style is, how to get the outcomes you want, how to ask the difficult questions. Yeah. Um, so to summarise, I appreciate I've, I've rambled there. I think it's personal brand. Yeah. It's go the extra mile um, and be be honest and, and a continued dialogue with your manager to to keep you on track. I love that. You, you, you're so right. Uh, and it's kind of like the, I could think the analogy of you can go to university to learn the theory on a master's a degree that you want to do, but until you actually get into the working practice or firm, you're not going to know what it's like. Mm. And I, I encourage SDRs to either shadow their, their, count, their future counterparts or their account executives 
run parts of that discovery call, you know, do the follow up, be the person that helps send the proposal post meeting mm. so you can get a taste of what is it really going to be like. Uh, so I think that's some solid advice. But I know we're kind of coming up for time and it's been an absolute pleasure to have you both on. And this is what I like to call a dynamic duo episode. So we've got some real gold nuggets here. So there is a, a question that I normally ask at the end of this. And I'm going to try something a little bit different. So I'm going to start with James. What one bit of advice would you give to a younger version of yourself who's about to embark on this journey of being a BD than going into management? What would that one bit of advice be to that person, James? Um, <clears throat> I think I would say to myself, yes, we're in a target driven role. Um, yes, it's important to make sure you're hitting target, but at the end of every day, reflect and ask, did I put my people first? Mm. Um, and the pressures of sales, the pressures of management, the pressures of, um, the pressures of target, um is uh is yeah can can sometimes sweep you away um and you can forget the core of kind of what you're there for and that's to lead people and make sure that they're um being led in a way that's going to make them successful and i think um reflecting on that every day and saying did i put my team first today um is super important to knowing that that you're um an effective um, not only manager, but an effective leader. Um, and that's something that, that I've learned over the last year is um, if you put your people first, um, the results the results will, will always show. Solid. Thank you very much for that, James. Now, Ollie, I want to do something a little bit different with you here, sir. So obviously we've asked James to talk about giving advice to like his past self. But let's imagine for a minute, in a year's time, you're going to watch this episode back and you're going to see the younger version of yourself. What advice would you give to your future self to make sure they stay or they get to where they want to be? As standing here today, what advice would you give to your future self? Uh, great question. I think just take risks. I think with risks, there's, uh, it's cliche, but there's reward. Um, I think. Whilst, uh, whilst you're still young and you've got less responsibilities, um, I think like you said at the start of the podcast, podcast um, if you take a risk and it goes wrong, get another job um, yes. and, and go from there. You're always going to learn. And, and if, you don't, if I didn't take the risk of, of moving industry, um, then I wouldn't be sort of ach achieving and, and getting where I want to be. So I think that uh, would be my advice. Um, but also keep smashing it. <laughs> <laughs> you heard that future ollie remember these wise words said by your, your, your younger self all right jens thank you so much and james uh just quickly come to you are there any kudos or shout outs that you'd like to give out on today's show um yeah i think uh first kudos obviously has to go to to ollie for uh for coming into the business and um and absolutely and absolutely smashing it, um, becoming a glo becoming the global top performer, um, but also uh, for for throwing for throwing himself uh, deep into his learnings, um, for, for for reflecting, but also um, for for standing strong in knowing what he wants, when he wants it, and how he wants it. Um, because I respect that more than anything, and it helps me guide uh, that success even better. Um, Kudos to my team for keeping us at 100% for the whole year so far. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, they've done a pretty, pretty smashing job of that. Um, so kudos to every single person that's working, uh, working their butt off every single day uh, to do so. Um, and then, yeah, kudos to Quintana, actually, for, for helping us kind of um, be successful and, and giving us the opportunities that we have so early on in our, career, in our sales careers, um, like becoming a manager after a year and, um, and hopefully Ollie soon to be an AE um, after kind of like a year to 18 months, like um, those kind of opportunities are, yeah, uh, are definitely going to be, um, are definitely going to be kind of looked well upon um, as we enter kind of the next parts in our career. Cool beans. That's a whole loaf and slice of hashtag sales love there. James, thank you very much. <laughs> and Ollie, for yourself, are there any shout outs or kudos that you'd like to give today, sir? Yeah, of course. I'll, I'll keep it short. I don't want to um, repeat too much on, on what James says, but obviously, firstly, to, to James. Um, I mean, he's been there, done it, got the T-shirt of, of what I'm doing now. 
Um, and actually, when I interviewed, I interviewed with a, with a different manager, um, as James said. Um, so to come into the business, learn for some, from someone that's done it, hold me accountable, be honest, um, have some quite frank conversations, um, which is my style anyway. Um, I think he's put me in a position to succeed um, and to, to really get where where I want to get, get to. Um, so, so I think that's that's massive kudos of, of learning from um, someone that, that, that smashed it. Um, I think obviously Cantata putting us in the position, echo everything that James said. Hmm. Um, and then I think the final one to um, call out is uh, my good mate, Trakesh Aswar. Um, so again, he's the cat executive here at Cantata and he was the one that um, encouraged me over a beer to take the step. So uh, a <laughs> big shout out to him and, and he's helped me no end to to know the role and, and smash the role like, like he did. So, uh, so yeah. Love it. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And a big thank you to our listeners, watchers and subscribers. Uh, as mentioned with all of our guests, their LinkedIn URLs will be in the show notes. So if you want to connect with James and Ollie, pick their brains or kind of expand upon anything they've spoken about today feel free to reach out to them and if you're watching this or listening to this on your local podcast platform or youtube please make sure that you give us a like rating and subscribe for james and ollie from cantata it's been an absolute pleasure having you as a dynamic duo on the show i wish you all the best of luck thank you for giving us some time today and most importantly gents happy selling cheers Neil. Thanks, Neil.